Jenna House. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the president and CEO here at One Generation. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Astowell for bringing us this exciting day and uh, being able to learn more about this book. Um, so I just wanted to welcome everybody and say thank you for being here. And I wanted to introduce uh, our board president, Stu Finley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna, and it's a pleasure to be here today. It's a pleasure, I mean, and finally he had to write a book for us to get together again after a bunch of years. I mean, you, you could have picked up the phone. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here in terms of all the people who have known Dan, some of them for a little bit longer than I have, but I was trying to figure it out. It probably goes back 25 years at least. More. At oh, least. More. Uh, and when Dan asked me to introduce him this morning. I tried to think of how, how I could do this. And I came up with a three-word description of Dan. And it is printable and, and tapable, so that's not a problem. <laughs> Polymath, Renaissance man. Because in the time that I have had the, the privilege and pleasure of knowing Dr. Dan Osterweil, I have worked with him as a colleague uh, in terms of, uh, as an elder law attorney, having clients who needed the services of one of the premier uh, geri uh, geriatricians in the country, uh, as a mentor, teaching me a lot about my clients, and having the privilege of working with him and teaching some of his students in his role as professor at UCLA on some of the, the finer points of what we do as elder law attorneys. But getting to know Dan beyond the professional takes you into a whole other world. And you get into probably one of the most empathetic, funny physicians. Now, those may be oxymorons to some people, but <laughs> not to me. People I have ever had the pleasure of knowing. And then you go beyond that, an innovator. I remember sitting with Dan at his home in Westwood as he showed off his new toy one of the very first telemedicine robots that was functioning at a facility out in Thousand Oaks, I think it was, and he's sitting there on his computer and he's, I mean, he's having fun treating a client, a patient, at this facility via this robot. And that was one of the first times we saw any of this, which is now becoming ubiquitous. And then there's the artist. This man is one of the, I, I am so jealous of his artistry with a camera, it makes me sick. But he is phenomenal. I'm sorry we didn't have an opportunity to have some of his artwork. And now, just to prove that my description is absolutely right of polymath and Renaissance man, here he is as, as an author bringing not just a, a autobiography, but a novel, or an autobiographical novel, but bringing his imagination and his sense of artistry to telling an incredible story. And with that, Dan, welcome to One Generation. Welcome back to One Generation. Thank you, Stu, for the generous introduction, and thank you, everybody, to, you know, who made the time to, to come and join today in this celebration. It's, it's really a celebration. And um, I would like to thank, actually, first, a lot of people who made this possible. This book would not have happened if I were not married to my wife or not. Mm -hmm. We tolerated those years of nagging and looking and flying around the world to find the details about this movie. And about this, it's not a movie yet. And my son, and who is here, Amir, who encouraged me to continue. He's a story buff, so he liked that whole concept. And Hannah and Steven are good friends for many years. In fact, I have to thank Hannah for making my slide presentation a little more snazzy, which mine was kind of dry, you know, PowerPoint. And I'm very glad to see my friends uh, Gabriela and Ulf who have been in our life since our life here in Encino and now on the West Side. And of course, the Hava who followed, followed us for many years with all those uh, wonderful celebrations with UCLA and others. And Stu and Carol, which, you know, we celebrate a lot of 
Sukkot and other holidays when we lived in the valley. So it's really a kind of celebration of getting together. I wish we had some more people coming and listening to this, but you know, we <coughs> see. Now a little bit of a backdrop, and I won't hold you here for two hours, so relax. <laughs> um, the book was essentially, I wouldn't say an afterthought, but something that was brewing for years. I did not know enough about my parents and my, my father in particular to, to write this book. And I kind of knew pieces of that. But one day in, in the mid-80s, I get a call from a cousin of mine who lived in Connecticut, and he said, Do you, uh, have you seen the book uh, where your father is mentioned? I said, no. He said, well, Gilbert Martin was actually Gabrielle and Wolf know personally mentioned him in his book, The Holocaust. So I said, oh, that's interesting. And he sent me the book. So I looked at the references. I went to UCLA, pulled the other references. And I said, oh my god. My father didn't talk about it. And did not mention it. I knew that he had to do something with children in Budapest. And I know that he saved more than 200 kids. Uh, and brought them to, to safety uh, after the war, but I didn't know the details. So that was kind of the motivation. I wanted to commemorate. I wanted to, to have his legacy. And my mother, who was kind of always as, you know, Shashela Farm is the woman in the back, but I think she was very instrumental in making, helping him do what he did. So what I'm trying and walk you through, uh, now this is something that I have no control over. Did it turn off? Yeah. yeah I'll try and kind of give you a, a snapshot. Yeah. Snapshot of what we're going to talk about. Uh, give you, you know, everybody knows the story of what happened in 1939 and, and the fact that. Uh, Poland was invaded in the war. Touch upon some of the things that happened once they invaded. Uh, for the sake of today's history, you mentioned the Riventrop-Molotov pact, which has a lot to do with what's happening in Ukraine today, if anyone is, a, is aware of that. Um, tell you one or two stories about the ghetto and the concentration camp that my father was in, the heroic escape from the camp, and who helped him to do that. And then landing in Budapest, which was not occupied by the Germans, and doing most of his work there. And then survival, uh, and the story of my cousin, who I see as a brother, uh, Joseph, who lives now in, in uh, Rockville, uh, how he got into that story. So, for those who don't know, Poland is kind of had a lot of cantons. You know, this is kind of uh, Warsaw is here, and the town that I'm talking about is in eastern, southern Poland, which is Tarnow, which is like 60 kilometers uh, east of uh, Krakow, which many people who visited Poland, Poland are familiar with. Carol, have you been to uh, Krakow? Yeah, it's on the list. <laughs> so, I'll give you a kind of an appetizer. This is Krakow. This is actually a beautiful town. Uh, it has a lot of Renaissance architecture. And the small town that my parents grew in uh, was Tarnow. Uh, 40,000, I think, uh, habitants. And it had a thriving Jewish community. In 39, there were 40,000 inhabitants in Tarnow. Half of them were Jews. So it was a big center. And the picture on the left is actually the end of the story of, Targo of the picture of Targova Street, actually, which a little bit hit from here is, the is my grandparents' house. Mm -hmm. Which, interesting enough, I found a remote <coughs> cousin whose parents went to Russia and came back and were communist in, in Poland. And he's corresponding with me, and he sent me a video from today, and the house still exists. And I saw it actually in 2000. 
And it's very similar to a picture that is in the book where my mother's sisters are standing there and photographing the back. So it's all real. And of course, I have a big synagogue, actually more than one, but as the Germans came, it was all burned down. And this is a memorial that exists today uh, to that synagogue. So in historical terms, you know, the critical parts, September 1 to October 6, were when the Germans came in, they came into uh, took Warsaw, I think, on you know, September 1, and Tarnow was already occupied in September 7. And my sister, who was very little at that time, uh, saw my mother looking at the sky with those airplanes, and she was fluent in German, and said, so help me God, you know, mm -hmm. help me God. And he, she kind of knew what's coming. And immediately after that, they were actually put, put in a, they had to move out of their apartment to the ghetto to sit, to share, like two families sharing one room, and the bathroom was out. It was not fun. Now, what does the Riventrop Molotov uh, non aggression pact has to do with it? During that period, actually even earlier, uh, Stalin, who you see here on the, right, on the left, uh, and his uh, foreign, foreign secretary, Riventrop, um, signed an agreement with the German, actually, Riventrop was German, but Molotov was the one who was replaced by the Jewish foreign foreign ministry, because Stalin did not, um, Hitler did not want to deal with the Jewish uh, um, Russian representative, they signed an agreement which essentially said, you're going to take this part of Europe, and we are going to take this part of Europe. And they agreed that they are not going to attack the Germans, and the Germans are not going to attack them. Right? Wrong. <laughs> In four. You know, for two years, that was the case. So the so Russians came into what is Ukraine today, took it over. The Germans came from the West, and my father and his contingent, he was a military doctor, was pushed into an area which you all hear on the news, now it's called Viv, at that time it was called Vov, and in, in previous time it was Lemberg, which tells you this, this area was changing hands throughout history. So, In June of 20 of 41, uh, the Germans said, okay, what we said, we didn't mean it really. <laughs> and they essentially uh, invaded what was at that time, you see the line here, occupied by the Russians. And it sort of, it explains why Putin right now is also going, and he's going from the other side, trying to take the same area. It was a flat area during the Napoleon invasion. It was the same area that they have invaded. So this area is not uh, unfamiliar to foreign invaders. But during that time, my father was caught between the rock and the hard place. He was Jewish. The Russians took over. And somehow he was able to find a place in a little spa town called Truskavitz. And they needed a doctor. So he was a doctor for Russian soldiers in Truskavitz. Well, when the Russians were pushed away by the Germans, the Germans caught him and threw him into a concentration camp, which is called Yanovska. Now, this camp um, was initially a war camp for not only Jews. The Germans used it to rehab their equipment, and so you had the story here splits. You had the ghetto here, which is down off on, on, on the, the left, where people were squeezed into one block square, and they blocked streets, they blocked stores, and people kind of lived. And there were parts that had a permit to work. They were lucky, Camp A. And Camp B were those that were actually decrepit kids, older people, and they were essentially designated by the Germans for deportation, which happened there very frequently. Mm -hmm. At the same time, my father was working in a curry and in a cemetery. And you can imagine 
hit a hole for myself or stew, which never worked with hard stones, working all day breaking stones so the Germans can pave the roads with it. At the same time, my mother in the ghetto wonders where her husband is. She had a very young a daughter, and my two uncles, uh, Yezik's father and another brother of my father, worked in a shop of a, gen of a gentleman who was, um, he was not an SS, he was in the Wehrmacht, and he was Austrian in, in origin, which I'll talk about in a minute. Middle, in a minute. And he, as they took over essentially the tailoring shop of my grandfather. And people worked there to produce tailor, tailoring work for the Wehrmacht. But Madrich, the name of Julius Madrich, the name later became, <coughs> a right, he was awarded the Righteous of the World uh, Award uh, by Ad Vashem. He said, that's an opportunity. Let's bring as many people from the ghetto to work. He put like two, three people on one sewing machine, one singer, so he can give. And his uh, assistant, Fritz, which I'll mention in a minute, went to the SS, to the Gestapo, and says, I need 150 people. So they gave him a list. He went out and changed the 150 to 250. He said, no, it's 250. And he took more people. And those two people really did a lot to help bring food into the ghetto. And they had a truck. And Fritz. Um, comes to my uncle Usher and says, did you ever think what will happen to you if you don't leave? My uncle looked at me, how can a German comes to me and says, I don't know. He says, I have a plan. And I'll talk about the plan. In the meantime, I just want to share with you a story. This is essentially a painting that my sister Eva, who at that time, maybe five, uh, she drew it in 1977 and donated it uh, to Yad Vashem later on. And when I asked her, what did you pick here? He said, this is an actia, this is a deportation. The story that I got from my mother about this picture says, I'm not sure what was inspiring Eva to, to draw this, but I can tell you what happened here. There was a deportation coming, and my father told my mother, when there is a deportation, go to the Jewish hospital, the director there will keep you safe. She goes with my sister to the Jewish hospital and says, I'm sorry, all the patients are counted by the Germans, I cannot give you any space. So she walks with her daughter outside into the Aryan, takes off the they had uh, a blue, not a yellow star, but the blue, they call it Opaska. They took it off. And she looked and says, what can I do now? And then she sees a young couple of lovers going and strolling in the boulevard. And she says, hey, why are you I go in this direction? And they say, yeah. I say, I have some chores to errands to around here. Can you take my daughter to, and she gave the name of the house of my grandparents where the janitor was favorable, who was a Coptic, it was not a Catholic, it was a Coptic Paul. Go to him and leave my daughter there. And she gave them two slotes. My mother came an hour later, and the guy was pale as the wall. He says, you know those two guys? That this couple? She said, oh yeah, I know them. She lied. <laughs> and when you ask my mother, did you plan it? Did you think about what you're doing? She says, no. It was instinct. I took my glasses off, so I cannot not do any direct eye contact with anyone. And it just worked. And that was how she survived. Now, to tie it into the picture here, there were two ladies that hid in the basement of that house with my grandmother. And the two of them went into town with their bag, with their signs, and with the address of this house. Of course, they were stopped. And hours later, a soldier that you see here on, on the right with the, with the lantern came to look for them. So he pulls those three ladies out of the basement, my grandmother and those two ladies, and 
And Irma, my sister, tells me she remembers that. She says, and I screamed, Grandma, Grandma. And he looked around and said, who is the grandma of this beautiful child? And my mother said, I was never told to lie, and I didn't lie here either. And she po pointed to her mother, my grandmother. He took my grandmother and pushed her towards her and said, take care of her. Took the other ladies and went away. And that is this painting. So it's kind of, even though it's not conscious, it's something that came up. <clears throat> Another thing that happened here was that there was another deportation, and Kopchik decided that he cannot stay in town. He was too afraid that he would be caught. So my mother said, you know what? Lock us in the stairway. There was a stairway going the whole way, and at the top, there was where the pipes go. There was a faucet, and there was a kind of a window on the top, and there was enough space for them. Give me some paper and some crayons, and just block us, wall us up with some wood. And when you come in a week or two, we'll see what happens. The whole house was occupied by Ukraine, which was, the Germans looked at them as Volkdeutsches. In other words, meaning they were, how do you say, German, Wolf, how you translate Volkdeutsches? Uh, essentially, national, they thought that they were from German heritage. Mm -hmm. They were the ones who helped a lot, the Nazis at that time, in the camps and in the ghettos, etc. So my mother was very afraid that if they sound any noise or any words say through the pipes, it will go, and somebody will hear there are, there are people there. So she told my sister to be quiet, keep, don't, don't say anything. And she gave her the crayons and the paper. Then she discovered my sister had done She just painted for eight days. She slept and painted. But one night, out of sleep, she screamed. And my mother said, that's the end. Well, luck. Nothing happened. I had discussions with my nieces about their relationship with their mother. And one of the nieces, my second niece, she said, you know, I didn't know much about my mother until I read your book. And she said, she reminded her, during the sirens, they lived close to Tel Aviv during the first um, <coughs> war. There were missiles falling in Israel, and nobody knew whether they were with gas, without gas, so sitting in those sealed rooms with their masks on. So Tali says, I looked at my mother and she was just swift, sh like shrunk in the corner, like a little child with a mask on her. And when I read the book, I understand what she might be feeling. So it was very interesting to see how those things tied together. To switch gears, at the same time, my mother was trying to find somebody to find my father. And my father, I said, was in this camp Yandowska. The details about this camp are in the book. I'm not going to in, into that. It was, was pretty awful in terms of how people were treated. And that's the place where my father, that's how my discussion with my father started about his past. And that was during my bar mitzvah day. And uh, it was a very hot day in April. And kind of worked, he put the tie slowly, and I said, well, we have to go, and you know, the synagogue kind of knows where it is, it's up the hill, so it's, it's a big schlep walking, and I tell him, I have to run, all right, I have to be on time. He says, we're driving. I said, driving? In those days, it was not common to drive on Sunday, even if you're not an observer. It's just out of respect. He says, no, I'm driving, I'm sick. He was already not very healthy at the time, and he said, well, and we drove. And later on, I caught him and I said, what was this story? And he said, look, you wanted to do bar mitzvah, I supported you. Did you ask me if I care about it? I said, no. I can tell you I don't. He said, why? How can it be? 
said, look, and this goes back to this camp. When I was there, something happened that made me raise questions about that there is God out there. And he comes back, and as you see here, the railroad here, and the cemetery was here, and coming back to the camp. And then, as you cross the gate, there were bathrooms. And if you go left to the bathrooms, there was a brick wall. Not brick walls, you know, red brick wall. And he comes back at the end of hard work, and he sees about, I don't know, either 10 or 12 kids standing, and a firing squad on the other side. He says, oh my god. He sits and squats there and says, if God is there, they know what's good. Because God tells people, gives people direction, <coughs> and they will not be shocked. But they were. At that moment, he made sort of a vow for himself. If he survived this hell, he's going to dedicate a big chunk of his life to work with kids. And he was a pediatrician, so that was part of his profession, but kind of worked full time working with adults. So keep that in mind because that became later on an issue. At the same time, my mother was interviewing people to try and find him. And the, the assumption was that it's probably here. It was like 150 kilometers from Tarno, so that's likely where he was. And there were rumors that maybe, so she started interviewing Poles who were in the underground. With, for money, will they go and get him out? And she, my mother said, I didn't trust them. They look like, like delinquents, like, like criminals. You know, they had those long sideburns, their nails was clean. I couldn't trust them. And then my uncle comes and says, you know, this Fritsch told me that he has a plan. Why don't you talk to him? So Fritsch came to see my mother in the ghetto. And he was a decent guy. And he said, I can get Monek, my father's out of there. She gave him half of the money, and the other half is when he comes back. And he, get, he got to the cemetery, and he bribed the, the guard with some cigarettes or something, and tells my father, tomorrow, when the truck crosses the railroad, it slows down, jump and I will give you clean clothes and we'll get out of here. My father immediately trusted him and in fact this camp in the back in this part had a lot of dunes so it was not very well guarded and people were trying to escape through the dunes but usually either because of unsympathetic people around involved they were turned in or they were just shot. Uh, and I could never figure out how did he get out of this hellhole. And years later, uh, one of the nurses that joined him in Budapest later on said, don't you know why he, said, why he was not sent to the, to the train? I said, no. She says, because he helped the doctor take care of the commandant's daughter. <laughs> now, when I get, well, went into the archive of this Gustav Wilhaus, he was a son of a gun, or son of a bitch, excuse my French. Every Sunday, especially when people were escaping or others, he was doing target shooting on people. And in fact, he was shooting on small kids, and his daughter was standing there and clapping, wunderbar, wunderbar, do, maftas, how? do it again, do it again. So for me, it was a shock, and I kept it inside. Said, oh, my father, you know, escaped this place because he helped you know, take care of, of this monster. And that hasn't left me, but on the other hand, logically, he did what he needed to do to survive. And the doctor said to him, every time when he had typhus, he kicked him in the foot and said, go to work. And every time he went to the train and sent people to Belzec or to Auschwitz, he sent my father to the other side. And Fitch came, and my father said, that will not last forever. And he had two other inmates with him on the truck. And he was in about close to 40, so he was supposed to be an old guy. <laughs> and he tells the two guys, jump with me. I have somebody that will help you too. And he, that's the part that he repeated to me maybe 10 times. 
And I didn't understand why he insisted that he wanted them to jump with him. After I read the archives about the camp, apparently the Germans had a code. And they told the inmates, because they could escape, you walk, watch the, your friends get back. Because anyone who is escaping, nine others will be shot. So my father had in mind, I said, if he jumps, those two are doomed. The two looked at him, and he was just recovering from typhus, and he was thin. Ah, oh, you old guy, you're a senile, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm being from the truck, what are you talking about? Well, he jumped. They did not. Fritsch met him, gave him new clothes, they got on the train, and went up to Tarnov. Did not go into the ghetto, stayed outside, and my mother came to see him. And the plan was that he is going to go into a village, present himself as a Polish soldier's officer coming back from the front and just recuperate. And then they'll continue the trip south into Slovakia. So that's the photograph of, of Fritsch, and that's uh, Markic. And that's what happened. He slept for 16 days in the village, ate and slept. The villagers did not ask questions. They got very well paid by Fritsch to do that. And after 16 days, Fritsch came. And both of them went south to the border with Slovakia. And Slovakia was not occupied yet by the Germans. And a few days later, I mean, he brought in two smugglers. The smugglers took him across the border. And he, he was arrested for two days because he crossed illegally. But then they let him out. And he waited there for my, the other part of the family to join. And about three days later, Fritsch came to my mother and said, look, just take Eva, small bag, nothing fancy, and took her out of the ghetto through one of the blocked stores. And in the truck that waited was a double-deck truck, was my two cousins, Alva and, and Avram. My, Usher, my uncle Usher and his wife Hanka, and a couple that was recruited to be able to support the enterprise, because Fritsch wanted a significant amount of, of dough for this activity. And the driver was essentially a German who escaped from Dachau, who was a communist and escaped from Dachau. And um, they drove south. And you know, they're shooting around, they were stopped, and somehow, my mother and my sister were blonde, kind of looked legit, and they were able to cross, then they went on foot, usually high. At night, uh, they walked at night, and they rested in some, in some uh, village uh, during the day. And my sister remembers, actually, that vividly, that, that trip. And then they got and met my father. Before they crossed the border, everybody was searched. It was not searched by the Slovakians. It was searched by under activities. And, um, and from there, they got into guts. Uh, and that opens the part that where this gentleman also became very late the writers of the world. It was a poll by now, Herrick Slavic. Um, gave my father official papers as a poll by the name of Karoli Kotaro. That's essentially his Red Cross. Um, I, don't, I don't have the whole card, but I have this. You see Karoli Kotaro, his date of birth, and his signature. And that was the card that he used to do all the activities when he was working, work, working for Section 8 at the, the Red Cross. And the guy who helped him was this guy, Komoloi, who was a World War I uh, hero in Hungary. He was Jewish. And he had good relationship <coughs> with the fascists. And he was able to help my father open the first um, safe houses for kids in Budapest. But Slavic helped my father open the house in uh, Bats, which was like 20 kilometers. And that has, I don't want to bury with all the details, that's the picture. You mm -hmm. see my father here. Mm -hmm. This is the priest who was running this 
boarding house. His name was Bukharchik. Those are the two Jews uh, that he was a lawyer, actually, who came from another part of Poland and his wife. Together they kept this uh, house going uh, as a Polish refuge, Polish orphanage. And Bukharchik was coming every Wednesday to give a sermon. But inside, they learned about Judaism, about holidays, they celebrated Passover, they insisted. Now, this picture I saw in a microfiche in Yad Vashem, including two other pictures. And when I say I'm not tolerating, one night, like at 11 o'clock, I was looking at, searching the internet, and I said, where is this Jewish Vats orphanage? And I couldn't find it. And then popped a piece of some one of the program on CBS, and a guy by the name Ed Herman was interviewed. And he escaped from Warsaw with smugglers and was left to die in Budapest on the street. He was crying, and a lady by the name of Schweitzer saw him and says, I'll bring you to Dr. Kotaro. And he brought him to Vats, and he said, It was a terrible place. I had those. those Beds, we had to, to share two kids the same bed. The kid that I was sleeping with the same bed had urinated at night out of fear, was one of the traumatized kids, and I got pneumonia. And there was a doctor there that took care of me. And I said, well, that's my father. <laughs> oh my god, he sent me those photographs. I said, I saw them, I saw them in, uh, in Yad Vashem. He said, yeah, I sent them there. I sent those there. <laughs> and he, he came, to, he, he has a separate story, which I won't bore you with. So that VATS was opened and it had to close in July of 44 when the Germans came. And the uh, Hungarians were very compliant. And in fact, my father was dragged into the police station and they tried to harass him and tried to strip him to see whether he's Jewish. And he waved his Red Cross card and Komolo's name and he pulled name and they left him. And they said, well, in two weeks, I want all the kids out. And the Russians were already at the doorsteps of Budapest, and he started opening the safe houses in, in Budapest, about six of them. Um, my sister said this was the one that they lived in, that's the same house. Um, and there is a story in 19. No, in 2000, 2008, I'm getting a phone call from my uh, nephew from New York, Zvi, he said, somebody called me, I was looking for Dr. Kotaro. <laughs> and I said, uh, you know, that's your grandfather. I said, I know, I gave him my father's name. And he gave his, Yosef his father's name. And we met with this guy. Uh, his name was George Axelrod. And I said, why are you looking for my father said, look, he saved my life. I just wanted to tell the story to my synagogue in, in Queens. And his story was that he was, he was born in, he was Paul. His parents moved to actually, to the Trans Sudeten. <clears throat> and then because they were sort of nationalistic Czech, they were sort of ostracized and sent into a labor camp. And they escaped from the labor camp and wandered into Hungary. <coughs> and went to a, a cloister, essentially. And he was taught how to be a priest. But then the, ne the Nilas started going to those cloisters and trying to actually pull kids from there and throw them into the Danube. So his father said, it's safer to go down into town. And he went into town, into the ghetto. And that was already when the Russians were on the other side of the Danube and shooting going on. And the Germans started shooting anyone in sight. And he was shot in his eye and his leg, and was thrown into a pile of corpse. And my father found him on the pile of corpse, oh. and pulled him out, and took him to a, a one of the safe houses, and nursed him. And just to give you a little sense of the realities there, and that each house had a little older kids and younger kids. And the older kid was like the captain of the, of the house, and the kid took care of the others because my father and his, my aunt couldn't really be there all the time. So two Russians came looking for deserters. 
And they see George was blonde, blue eye, was a little older than the other kids. And they pull the revolver to shoot him. And he says in Russian, So no vrai, I'm Jewish, don't shoot. So one Russian looks at the other, huh, the Germans did not have enough bullets for this one. <laughs> so they were not lovers either of humanity. <coughs> Um, so, as the Russians came into Hungary, uh, they were starting slowly to put their stamp on, on town. And my father was busy finding kids from all over, and I think at the end, he had like 206 kids mm -hmm. who were under his, his auspices. And of course, he had help from the Jewish Distribution Commission, from a name that some of you may know about or not, which is uh, Dr. Kastner, who was a lawyer mm -hmm. in, in Hungary, who later on was accused of collaboration with the Nazis and then was vindicated. But he had a lot of network there, including a Russian colonel who happened to be Jewish. And the colonel tells him, look, I see that you have all those kids to take care of. And he, they bartered. My father was a fan of watches. He was going to pawn shops, buying watches and bartering with this colonel. It's called, you know, for Russians at those years to have a watch, wow, that is like treasure. In fact, in Lvov, his friend told him, when you raise your hands to a Russian patrol, always keep your sleeve up so <laughs> nobody sees it. But they'll shoot you for, the, for your watch. But cut the long story short, the, the colonel said, you know, I know you want good life for those kids. So before we settle here, I suggest you find ways of getting out of here. And then he organized trucks and trains and took those kids to Prague, first to Bratislava, then to Prague. And then my mother had some kind of infection in her hand and she had to stay in Prague and he took the kids and my sister went with him, crossed into the German, US occupied Germany um, to Bamberg. And so that's January 1946. And my mother describes it as a day that just, you know, snowflakes, and she was sad, she was there alone. And all of a sudden, um, a kid comes out of this fog. Mm. And the kid was, was Yezhik, my cousin. Mm. Now, the reason it's so dramatic, because when weeks before, when in the in the train station in Budapest, it was chaos. Trains were not coming. And my mother was very myopic. And she sees a lady that she says, by the movement of this lady, she knew she was an operative from Palestine that was coming to save kids from behind the Iron Curtain to bring them back to the West. So she screamed at her at the station and said, Rachel. My, my father said, who are you calling? She said, trust me. <laughs> Rachel said, what do you want? She said, where are you going? She said, I'm going east. So she said, when you go to Warsaw, she gave him a specific address. There is a kid there, answers the name Yezhik. Bring him to me. My father looked at him, are you crazy? What are you talking about? We have this chaos. On January 8th, which was one day before his birth, he shows up. Now, Erna and I have not heard his story. I grew with Yezhik, he, we shared the room. We didn't know about it how he escaped, but he told us, and I, again, a little bit to read in the book. But the stuff that he said, that the guy came to the, to the orphanage and said, your aunt asked me to bring it to her. And then for, I don't know, two weeks, two and a half weeks, train and walking, they were transported from one Eastern Bloc place to another Eastern Bloc place, and they were presented to the border, guard, to the border guards as Greek kids. As what? Greek kids. <laughs> and the two chaperones told the kids, whenever they are, call your name, because they had a list, just say Ken. To, 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 know, to those who know Hebrew, Ken is yes. Yeah. But they explained to the, to the guards that that's, that's, that's Greek. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how they got. Uh, and that's how he got to, uh, to Bamberg. Now, I don't think that you have the patience, it's probably late, 
to to hear Yezik's story because that's uh, you tell me whether you you want to hear it or not. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yes. Sure. All right. So Yezik was one year old. He was born in 1937. His parents, uh, Fager and Herman, uh, were very well to do. His father had a very striving, thriving business of uh, sh had a sh uh, shirt factory. And they just living the good life uh, in Tarnov. And even though everything was going south on their side, they said, no, it won't happen to us, as many other Jews. Yeah. And <clears throat> comes. One of the deportations in 1943, they're all called into the Rinek, which is the, uh, the mar uh, marketplace. And the men on this side, the women on this side, and Yezik was with, with his mother on the women's side. And the Wehrmacht was in the middle. And his mother saw what is happening, and she knew that that's probably the last time she sees him and others, and she says, go to daddy. She throws like a, a coat on him and says, run. And he says he ran in, cross, you know, in front of those gun-drawn Wehrmacht to his father. His mother was put on the train. That was September 3. In fact, that's the day that he counts as his mother's death, because he doesn't know what happened to him. And there's no evidence of one way or another that she went to Auschwitz. His father saw things happening and said, I have to take this kid out. And through again underground, he found a lady, which is in the middle of the picture here, Jana Pesek. She was a single woman, probably a communist, and they were very inclined to help people in, in trouble. And she took him to Warsaw and put him with a family. She did not keep him. And two weeks later, his father shows up. But the people who brought his father were different people than brought him. So he was allowed to visit his father on the weekend. And one day, the guy who was the head of this group tells him, you are sick today. I'm a doctor. I'm telling you, you are sick. You stay. And this is part that became a big thing for him. Because a week later, when he came to visit his father, two other people showed up. An argument ensued. And his father said, I'm leaving. And Yezik said, I'm going with you. And his father said, no, you stay. Oh. And he, he, his father said to the guy, let me just take my watch. So the guy says to his father, to Herman, where you're going, you won't need your watch. Oh. A minute later, like a bulb popped. It was an L-shaped room. Yosef turns around. Those two are gone. His father was going down with his head on the on the door, bleeding, dead. And he stayed there 24 hours with his father, a corpse, in the room. And they showed up the next day, and they killed the owners of the apartment because they didn't know, did not want the word to go out. They were Poles. They were there to rob him, essentially, and he did not give him. Because they were supposed to take him to Switzerland. That story I never heard until 1987. Wow. When Erna's father died, and we were in Encino, living here on Olin Street, and Joseph visited us coming, he worked for GTE, and he says, Well, I know it's sad, you know, your father died, but you know where he's buried. I don't. To cut the long story short, that was kind of uh, a trauma that he carried for years, thinking that the fact that he, he did not tell his father what happened the week before caused his father's death. And I tried to convince him that he actually had PTSD and he needs to go into therapy. And he's thinking now as an 85 year old person as opposed to a young kid. And one thing that uh, kind of made this a good experience, he actually went into therapy. And he says, what's the name of the therapy? Uh, with e? 
EMDR. EMDR, and he said he, he always poo pooed, he was an engineer, so he poo pooed all the stuff, mental health and stuff. He said, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And he continues now in therapy, kind of bringing all the stuff that he hid for so many years. Uh, and that was triggered by the fact that I worked with him very closely because he was close and he knew a lot of details. So that's his story. And that's, uh, he later on discovered, he knew that she was alive, Pesek. He visited her in 1986 in Poland. And he essentially kept, actually, he funded her until the, until the end of her life. He paid a monthly, uh, there was an organization in New York that, that handled that. And then he attested to her deeds and she got the uh, honorary uh, directors of the world. Now, the reason it's sort of, uh, again, it's another conflict in the book, because the person that everybody thought deserved the honorary directors of the world was Fritsch. Uh, Madridge got it, but Fritsch, the head of the committee, I don't know what you remember, who was it? One of the supreme judges in Israel wanted my father affidavit. And my father said to my mother, no, this award is for people who did things not for pay. <laughs> and I can remember vividly to this day those middle of the night arguments. What are you so stubborn? Just <laughs> sign this letter. Why? And he says, no. And I don't think, I mean, he's a great guy. In fact, he helped him a lot. He got a lot of grants from the JDC. He rehabilitated him when he came back to Germany. He, he built was able to buy a pension, and he, he was fine, but this honor he did not get. On my father's 60th birthday, surprise, he shows in our house. <laughs> and everybody's happy, drinking schnapps and everything, and then he, I see him approaching my father and says, Monet, why didn't you sign this letter? And my father, without blinking, says, Hagdens and Fritsch, you're a wonderful person. But this award was for people who did those things without getting an honorary. And you were. He says, I understand, I disagree with you, but I understand, and, and they continue being friends. In fact, we invited him many times back. He even spent the Seder with us in Munich, where my father simultaneously translated the Seder, the Haggadah, to German so he can understand what was going on. <laughs> That was the type that my father was. Anyway, I, I have more stories to tell, but I think that time is probably right to uh, pause here and see whether you have any questions or comments. When were you born in, in all of this? I was born in 1947 when we moved to another DP camp in Bleibel. Uh, it's called Ansbach today. So it's somewhere in the middle between Nuremberg and Munich. Did I say correctly? Your father, or somebody, had good relations with fascists and was able to. Komoloi. Komoloi. And how did the Komoloi was Jewish? And did they they knew he was Jewish? And yes. So that's yeah. There was a very love and hate between the fascists and the Jews in Budapest. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if 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 the Germans were not mixing in, probably the Jewry of Budapest would have been saved. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, they were not nice to them. They were throwing them and killing them from time to time. But on the other hand, there was some kind of modus vivendi between them. And because Komoloi had so much credit, political credit, with uh, the two uh, chancellors, he was able to navigate. And in fact, at a certain point, he held the office of the uh, Red Cross uh, in Budapest. When so what precipitated that uh, that big like when they put all the shoe tied the shoes and threw them in the that well, happened all the time. Uh, in fact, another story which I didn't tell you is of uh, Shlomo Arad, oh. which I I only met at my mother's funeral. Uh, he is also now in his eighties, and he was a kid with his brother who escaped the same way from Poland into Slovakia. And his mother was put in jail, and they couldn't find her after that. But they were let out of jail and wound up also in one of the cloisters. 
and they thought that the cloister had a lot of develop, developmentally disabled kids, so it was sort of safe that, you, that he, Nilas would not do, but the Nilas started getting rid of them too. And one of the times they, they walked them down to the Danube, mm -hmm. there was a Russian raid. So Shlomo took the advantage of everybody scattered around, grabbed his brother, and ran into town and hid under a pathway. And that's where my father fought, found him. He was kind of emaciated after running and not having. But that, that happened all the time. In fact, one of the houses, the glass house, one of the safe houses that my father was involved, was raided by the neighbors. Uh -huh. But later on, the Jewish um, Zionist organization were very well organized in Budapest. And they had a network, and they bribed people. They, they kind of kept things livable to, this, to the extent you see, you can call it livable. Okay. But it was not a new or old. That happened all the time. <coughs> Why did you decide to write a novel rather than a biography or a historical? Excellent. That's, that's, that's a, a very good question. In fact, everybody in my family said I should insist. But that has to do with, I did self-publication. In order to get it out, uh, the format of writing a novel, I had to find many more references and evidence. Yeah. And I was born after the events. <laughs> and it was simply too daunting of a, of a job to, to write it. As a, you know, like, you know, like Gilbert Martin writes, and every word that he says has a reference. Yeah. Uh, I could know, I didn't have the luxury of doing it. So I call it an historical novel. Uh, but had to. Had to. Yeah. Based on. And it's not a uh, novel. It's not a novel, you're right. I mean, it's 99.9% it's factual. <laughs> but honestly, the way I got all this information was I, I would say that there are about three co writers to this book. One is not here, that's my mother, who died short of her 100th birthday. And when my father died, he, he died rather young, she started talking. And in fact, I actually discovered that for her, those times, as terrible as they were, they were very meaningful in her life. And she was, she was a remarkable woman on her own accord, because she uh, left Poland in 1920. Uh, 1926, and went to Florence to study uh, in the university. It was very rare in those times. At the same time, my father went to Perugia to study medicine. She graduated in 1929 with a certificate in philosophy and education, and went to Palestine. Now, anyone who knows the history of Palestine, 1929, there were riots in Palestine. But she went to visit her friends who lived in different kibbutzim, and she actually thought maybe she actually was settled in Palestine. If not for my father, cunning letters saying, you know, your parents really need you, they're not doing so well. <laughs> and being a good girl as she was, she came back. Wow. And then a few years later, they got married. <coughs> my father was interning and then in the residency in the hospital in Krakow, the Jewish hospital as a pediatrician. And until, you know, the war. After in 1939, she had a school that she ran, a little kindergarten that she ran. Um, and, but during the war, she always played second field. I mean, she, my sister thought things the world of her, of her. And I, I can see why. Because in very dire situations, she just took her out of harm way and was able to feed her. And my sister says she never felt that she was deprived of anything. In fact, on her fifth birthday, it was still in the ghetto, my father found, my mother found lilac, you know, the flowers, which was my sister's favorite flower. And she was able to drag from her house a uh, table cover. And she actually celebrated her, her birthday. So the lilac became actually our family Mm -hmm. uh, trophy, so to speak, and then my father planted like, like in our house, and he had allergies, he wasn't sneezing when the lay like was blooming, so it was fun. <laughs> yeah? Uh, was your father ever 
um, able to get in touch with the children, any of the kids he had saved, or did they find him? They found him. I mean, he, he was in touch. Uh, one of them, which is in this picture, the two of them here, this is Marisha. This is the one who told me about my, why my father was able to survive the camp, and this is Gusta. Those are two kids. Marisha is actually from Polish descendants from the same town my parents were, and Gusta was from a Hungarian family. And they actually, my father trained them as nurses, they became our aunts, and Marisha became the head nurse in the hospital that he opened in Area Cove in Israel, which was the first TV hospital. And Shlomo Arad came to my father, he was a paratrooper, so he came as a lieutenant with a red cap. And everybody was very proud to see my father. My father was a little shorty, walking with him in the hospital, and he, he came to say thank you. And he also gave me some, some details. I and mean, I kept in touch with him, but he kept in touch. And there are probably half a dozen that he kept in touch with. Yeah. So how is it you got from the camps in Germany to Israel? Excellent question. Well, we were in uh, Ansbach until 1949, and everything is political when you go to Israel. My father was brought up on the Zionist socialist uh, background as a Shomer Tzahir, and he was hoping that those kids that he brought out of Hungary, the Polish kids, the Hungarian kids, would come to Palestine, which was already a state in 48, Israel, and they'll settle and to be like a communal uh, stuff, but the powers to be thought that he was not the right leader for them, and you know they grabbed them for one youth movement, the other youth movement. And he just stayed with a small group of children, the youngest, and then he got the job as the head of the pediatric unit in uh, Ansbach, but that was too small for him. Even though there, he taught me a public health lesson there. He said he had a lot of resources from the JDC and the US Army. So he screened all the population of Ansbach for infectious diseases. He thought all those people were malnourished and they should be. And that was not his job, but, kind of, but then when that ended, the JDC offered him the job of Bogen, being the director of the Bogenhausen Spital in Munich, which was also in shambles. And he went there, and until 51, he was the medical director of that hospital. In fact, there even he sort of showed some of his character because a lot of the patients, actually 99% of the patients were Jews coming from the, from the camps. And they were complaining they were treated by Nazi doctors. So when the US uh, MPs were going to their dossiers and everyone that had a card, you know, carrying card of the Nazi party, he suddenly discharged them. And I kicked myself in the foot that I don't have that, because I had a clip, a newspaper from Munich. The title was The Jewish Nazi. <laughs> Somebody wrote, how dare this Jew, you know, fire all, the, all of us out of the hospital. Uh, but he stood by it, and in fact the hospital thrived after that. And he was offered a job to open a hospital in Israel. It was a 300 bed uh, TB hospital close to Tel Aviv. So we all moved there, and uh, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. All right, so if there are no other questions, thank you so much for coming. Thank you.